Hey, listen, would you like to know the four, four high income skills that allowed one of my friends, a broke, struggling personal trainer, not me, but one of my coaching clients and friends, Frank Dan Blanken, to go from that level to owning multiple million dollar businesses in Holland, not just in America where it's easy to sell stuff, but in Holland with all the rules and regulations, he was able to do it. And I'm going to teach you along with Frank in this podcast, those four, four high income skills, they're going to help you become a millionaire. So Let's get into the show. You're going to love learning from Frank. He is known as the tank or as Thanos because he reads like a book in 35 minutes. It's insane. And he's going to teach you how to do that too. All right. So let's go to the conversation. All right, Frank, welcome to the show. This is going to be a lot of fun. Thank you for having me anytime. Man, this is going to be great. So, so where are you right now? Are you in your 17,000 square foot house in Holland? Or are you in Dubai or Spain? I'm actually at home right now. I'm leaving on Monday. So for now, I'm, I'm going to Marbella. Okay. To film more videos and stuff and get a break? Yeah, so film more videos. Like you have four or five big gyms there. There are a lot of influencers there, so I shoot content with them. So that always yeah. makes it a little bit easier. Yeah, and then how long do you stay? For right, right now, we're staying for nine days only because I need to be back hosting an event here. So, and it's only a two hour flight. So that's doable. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, I love the, uh, the, the fact that you just, one of the overarching messages of this podcast is certainly like how much freedom you have in your life. And now at the same time, you also run, <laughs> you run like 14 businesses and we're going to talk about how you got to this place with your freedom. But right now you also run like 14 businesses. What are like the top three or five? So I've got my own fi uh, fitness business. That's probably number one. Then I got a business that my wife actually runs. And that's also a fitness bi coaching business. We got a clothing line that's female sports leggings. We got uh, training equipment. Think about uh, wrist wraps, sleeves, all that stuff. Yeah. We got, uh, I got a payment service provider that I use. That's one of probably my best ones. So those are the five main ones. And then I got some other projects where I'm not heavily involved in. They're just running. So you know, one of the things that amazes me is that you work predominantly with a fitness business. It's everything, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then so how, how many people do you think have seen your ads in, in Dutch? In your, what is there, like 15 million people in your country? Or, and probably million. half of them have seen your ads? 18 million, and I think 3 million see them every week, at least. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay, so so we're going to get how you got to this point, but we met in two, well, we met a little bit before 2018, but you, the first event of mine that you came to was in 2018. That was in Frankfurt, yeah. Germany, and things weren't going uh, the way they are now. What was your situation back then? Uh, so I was doing primarily only fitness coaching it was the only thing i did and basically i didn't have exactly clear where i needed to focus on so i was doing a lot of things at the same time and that made it pretty hard and like i was doing one thing on monday and the next thing on tuesday and a new event on wednesday and it was just all over the place and i didn't have boundaries that's something i noticed is like what i got from you is like okay set boundaries uh for example my phone used to blow man messages every day like crazy because I didn't set a boundary on how many times you could message me. So but these people do message me all the time. So stuff like that and just more structured approach to pretty much everything. Yeah, and so back then you were working like 12 hours a day, six days a week sort of thing? Uh, every day. And I think <laughs> I got up at like 6 a.m. And I think I finished at like 11 p.m. Wow. And I just did that every day. Now, when you're in that situation, what's what's the first, you know, switch that flips or thing that you did that, you know, obviously putting boundaries in there helped, but what else was like the big mover that allowed you to then have more time to work on building the business? So what I noticed is like I was doing a lot of things and you did an assignment. I remember that. I think there was uh, the girl from Malta as well that was there. I remember that. Oh, yeah. And yeah, we were doing the assignment. I was like. Why do I do this project? Because this is the one that's making money. And the other two just waste my time, basically. And I barely make minimum wage doing that. 
So the first thing I did is I killed those and I just spent more doing the thing that was actually working. It was actually generating revenue and helping me to scale. So that's basically the first thing I did. It was so clear to me. It was like, oh, I'm just not doing the things I should supposed to be doing. Yeah. And so now your business is, is largely driven by Facebook ads to webinars to sales calls. What was like the first domino that was you worked on that allowed all of those things to improve? Was it the Facebook ads and how did you make time uh, for it? And what was like something that really helped? Okay. The first step was uh, optimizing the back end. So the fulfillment of the coaching was more automated. So I actually got time to, to spend on marketing and sales because I think you said it or Vince said it that 80% of your time you spend on marketing and sales. Uh, yeah, that's a Mark Ford quote from his book, Ready, Fire, Aim. He said, yeah. 80% of your time, when you're trying to get a million dollars in sales, 80% of your, your time needs to be spent in sales. And most people are fulfilling or doing something yeah. and not spending any time in sales. Yeah. So what I did is was I did the perfect week formula and I was making my schedule and I gave them goals. I was like, okay, what's fulfillment? Fulfillment is blue. Sales is going to be yellow. And marketing is going to be green. And I looked at it and I was like, the first round, I was like, that's not correct. The colors don't match up. Let me do it again. So I started switching it. And I was like, okay, and then what's the quickest way that I know skill? Like, I'm, I was already decent at writing Facebook ads because I was getting leads in. So I was like, I already know that. They always say, double down on something you're good at. Just keep doing that. So that's when I started buying Facebook courses like all over. And I started watching a lot of free stuff on YouTube, actually, where you can find literally how to set up Facebook ads and tricks and tricks that you actually can do. And I think I spent like two, three hours a day learning how to do that. And then directly after I had the book for two hours, like trying stuff out. So you, you've studied a lot of people. Who are some of your favorite people that you study for the Facebook ads? And, and especially like the free stuff on YouTube. And I know you've sent me some Alex Becker stuff. Yeah. Uh, is it him and who else is there? So Alex Becker is really good. I like uh, Peng Yun on YouTube. He has great oh, yeah. videos about you. Uh, I like watch a lot of John Pemperty stuff. Um, uh, Billy Jean. Uh, Billy Jean, what I mostly do is I look at his ads and I dissect them. So I just yeah. write them down. I'm like, okay, that's why he did this. That's why he did that. Stuff like that. Uh, Rudy Mayer I looked a lot at. Uh, so that was probably my top five that I used. Got it. Got it. And then... So you know, you worked with uh, it's John Pemberthy or Penberthy? Penberthy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so you you re, you started investing in some of his stuff too, right? Like actual coaching with him and going to some of his events. Yeah. So I remember I went to one of his events in the UK. It was on London. It was actually the week before I went to Frankfurt. I flown from the UK to your place. Oh. Okay. It was the week before, and I remember there sitting there in the audience and. John teaches Facebook ads together with a guy named Jabril. Jabril is probably the best Facebook ads, uh, ads guy that I know. Wow. And Jabril was on stage. And what happened is Jabril basically opened the Facebook ads manager dashboard. And I'm like, okay, now we're talking. Like He's going to show something technical. Like I've seen the screen. And he started pressing button. I was like, I literally clicked every button I thought that was there to figure out what was underneath it. And he showed me stuff I couldn't find. He showed me stuff like how to do it. He even helped a female. He basically did a pitch on stage where you're like, okay, anybody in the room, raise your hand. I'll pick you out. I'll help you this weekend with your Facebook ads and show you how to do it. So a woman raised his hand and he picked her and she was a wedding photographer in London. Mm -hmm. And he basically showed uh, how you could set up an ad for somebody who's just got engaged and who lives near her vicinity. And he got her like 34 clients booked in one weekend based on wow. that ad. Like more than she made in the entire year. With, he showed on stage how to do that. And then, so that guy, does he put out content or is it just the, uh, he puts he out has, content? He doesn't put out Facebook content. Yeah. He has a YouTube channel called Passport Heavy, where he does travel videos and where he makes money with affiliate marketing. Wow. And he has a final in a financial education business that's doing well. I think it's called the Bustionista. That's doing really good, great numbers. And he's just the guy at the back end that sets everything up on ads and stuff like that. And he's amazing at storytelling. Okay. Awesome. Wow. Okay. And his name is Jabril. J-A-B-R-I-L. No, Jabril. J-U-B-R-I-L. Got it. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. 
absolutely amazing. So, so I love how you approach this, like double down on the thing that is working because most people do what you were doing before, which is they see something that's not working and they spend more time on it or they continue to do it or even worse, they try to strengthen a weakness. But you looked at strengthening a strength after you improved the Facebook ads, what was like the next domino that allowed you to scale? Was it the copy on the page or was it going straight to the webinars? Uh, first was the backend with email marketing. So okay. improved email marketing. I did a lot of Ian Stanley stuff. Yep. So that helped a lot. Uh, so then was like, okay. And then probably was it, uh, Bedros told me, okay, you don't have a healthy business. You need more monthly recurring revenue in your business. So I added that in. That helped tremendously. And then probably when I started doing webinars, things went pretty crazy. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. let's go back to the email marketing because email marketing, we've had Ian Stanley on the podcast. He is a super sharp uh, marketer. We, I highly recommend his book. We often recommend his book, uh, Con Confessions of a Persuasion Hitman. What did you learn from Ian that allowed you to make your email marketing really successful? uh first if is like how to build a relationship on email mm -hmm. like i was basically typing valuable emails with no personality inside of it and i was like just let me type it more as who i am and where i'm about and then put the value in there and that helped tremendously and then also like i basically barely were doing call to actions to like other programs i was always pitching my coaching coaching and i had multiple programs i'm like let me just try to sell this because they buy don't I ain't buying this. Maybe they're interested in that. And my revenue just went up like crazy by doing that already. Got it. And then so what's an example of you putting a little bit of personality into the email? Like you know, you were just uh, so, teaching before. So what were you adding in there? So for right now, for example, I got my dog Hulk, you know, who the Hulk is. I got an Alaskan Malamute, he's like a pretty big dog, and he's like bulking like crazy because he gains about four pounds in a week right now. Right. So I, I talk about bulking in, a, in, a, a, in an email and I talk about how Hulk, Hulk is making more progress than anybody else in a coaching program, but he has better genetics. So I, I talk part about genetics and then I pitch a bulking ebook or a program or whatever I'm using. Got it. Yeah. Okay. That's perfect. And, and because a lot of people think, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to put so much, you know, what am I going to do? You know, show pictures of me and my kids or whatever, but it's not, it's just, Hey, I have a yeah. dog or, you know, this is my hobby yeah. or whatever it is. Because yeah. at the end of the day, you want, you want people to say, I feel like I know you. Right. And I'm sure you get that all the time. Yeah. That's something I noticed is like right now I moved to a new place. So don't, not many people know who I am here, but when I go to the old place where I live, everybody there knows who I am, but they know the names of my partner, the knows the names of my cats, my dog, they know what kind of movies I like to watch, where I've been uh, traveling, all that stuff they know because they read the emails, they see the videos. Like people don't buy for knowledge. That's something I noticed. People buy for personality, who you are. Because there might be a coach who's smarter than me. I'm sure there are a lot of them, but people don't buy from them maybe because they don't sound that funny or they're always like very strict. And they're like, that's more my personality. That's why I'm signed up with him. For me, for example, I have a fitness coaching business. My wife has one. Like my knowledge is better than my wife's. Like I studied 15 years. She started five years ago. There's a big knowledge difference. People still sign up with my wife because they like her energy more than mine. That's the only reason they sign up. They don't care about the knowledge. They're like, yeah, they will live in the same house. I get the knowledge. I just want the person who's more energetic to me. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, and I mean... I've had people sign up with coaching with me because they grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm. And, and yeah. so putting that information in there is, is really important. Now, Ben Vedros, you know, maybe this was a fitness business summit or something, but Vedros said to you that you need to have a healthier business with recurring revenue. So how did you add that? In? Uh, so one of the things I was really good at was group programs. I was launching group programs, like 12 week challenge, to get people shredded mm -hmm. and they were doing really well. But after the 12 weeks, I didn't have a really conservation. Then I was like, they do the 12 weeks again, they pay the same price and they just keep doing that. So I was making one sale at a time. But like, so I had a big spike in one month and then two months were low. And I want a big spike again and then like, it goes lower again. So Betos told me, why don't make the next level 
to get even shredded more and make that a reoccurring program and keep it running for forever. So I started implementing that and then I started racking up memberships and that helped more stabilize my business. So I had one big spike and then a small drop up because my monthly recurring state and then I had spike again and I went up to another level because those people added to the monthly recurring as well. So that made it a healthier business. So then from there, you, you've become a master of webinars in the last yeah. you know, couple of years. So who did you study? What do you, what do you feel are like the top two or three points for a webinar and, and you know, to get them to watch it, that hook, get them to keep watching and then finally yeah. to convert the sale? So the first person I saw webinars from was Russell Branson, the owner of ClickFunnels. Yep. So it works a lot of his stuff, like the Expert Seekers book, basically. I modeled my webinar based on what was in that book. Then I read uh, One Too Many from Jason Fatlin. I read that book. So I basically make the mix of both of them. Then I did a couple of courses from John Bamfordy because I was already in his coaching and he had a webinar program as well. So I'm doing webinars from him and his style. And another thing was like Vince was doing webinars at the same time, Vince Del Monte, one of my coaches as well. So I was seeing what Vince was doing. I'm like, I like that part. I don't like that part. So I just took pieces from everybody and made my own mix. But where I'm different than most people is like for tonight, I do a webinar. Sometimes I have slides, sometimes I'm in front of a whiteboard. And I will literally teach from a whiteboard for 90 minutes with no slides at all. Like okay. I know I can teach it from the whiteboard and basically explain super technical stuff make it sound super easy that's one of my gifts where i'm really good at and so was that something was that something that you developed over time or something that you naturally were good at my my dad is a teacher so okay. i think i got it from that from me and one thing i had is like i used to be a fitness trainer in the gym and i used to have like interns below me that i always had to teach so explain everything because they were social but they had no knowledge so basically i had to teach them everything so Every day, I was like for 30 minutes straight, I was just teaching on a whiteboard, like, okay, this is how you do this, and this is how you do that. So I became, I think, a better teacher by just doing a lot of reps on it. What would you say to somebody who feels they're not a very good teacher and who really wants to improve and, you know, maybe they're a financial advisor, or maybe they're, they're another fitness coach, or maybe they're an expert in cryptocurrency and they're like i need to be able to explain this to somebody in a simple way what are some of the yeah. steps that somebody can do there okay so one trick that i did is for example let me say like i'm looking into cryptocurrency so i read a book but i noticed like i learned from teaching so i read the chapter then i take my phone and i make a selfie video from like 90 seconds and i summarize the chapter that i just read i try to explain it to somebody else then I will send it to a friend of mine who's into crypto and is doing way better than me. Does this make sense? Just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. So he watches the 90 second video and he gives me a thumbs up or thumbs down. And that's all I need to know. So I got friends around me that just basically watch my videos summarizing content that I just read and give my own spin around it and say, okay, that you got wrong, that's right. So that's how I basically optimize it. And you can do this even with your partner. Like for example, sometimes we shoot a video to my wife. If I learn something about nutrition, I'm like, does this make sense to you? Can you follow me basically what I'm telling you? Yeah. And she will say, like, like, that makes sense, but I have no clue what that meant. Can you explain that more? Okay. Got it. Perfect. Okay. So then I think I interrupted you before you got to the point where you, you know, you, you explain, you do the webinar on the whiteboard, you explain things in a very simple way. How do you get people to take the final action and, and join the so program? What I noticed is people go from A to B and they have a certain point. So let's say you have a dad board right now and you want to have, be like, have a six pack on the beach. So they know the route they need to take, but there are always a few roadblocks along the way. So in my webinar that I teach, I show them that I can solve those roadblocks. And then I tell them about a clear path from A to B. And when they hear that path, basically all objections are broken. So basically they're like waiting for me. So a little, I asked them like, I explained to you how to do all this stuff. Do you want to do it yourself or do you want my help? And then they need to comment in the, in the chat box and they will literally tell me like, yeah, I want to do this. Like, this is, this is, I need your help. Like, I know what you mean, but it's too hard for me alone. I need your help. And then I give them a new offer and they sign up. Got it. Okay, perfect. And 
how do you how do you actually have people sign up? Is there a link that you drop in the webinar, or do they do something else? Uh, mo it depends on what I'm offering. It's like if it's below three thousand euros, they're strictly going to a sales page and then just can sign up because you can sell about three k on a webinar. If it's above that, then they can book a call. Basically, I say this is not for sale. I'm picky. It's my one of my one of who I'm coaching. I choose who I want to work with. So if you want, if you think you qualify book a call you get to go on a call with somebody on my team and that's basically where we do the offers that so it's either to a sales page where they just buy so there's the link or it's a link to a uh, to a basically an application page and then, and then the link to just buy is it mostly a checkout page or is it how does that how does that page look headline it's, copy it's, testimonials. A, it's just a checkout page with okay. testimonials on one side and basically the entire program laid out and then there's a buy button okay Great. And then how do your sales calls go? Like what, what's your format for selling the high ticket coaching? Like in, in a nutshell, like real brief, who did you learn okay. from and how do you guys set that up? Uh, I studied a uh, high ticket closer from Dan Walk. I listened okay. to that course. Then uh, I listened to a lot of Jason Capital stuff. Mm -hmm. And I spoke to him in New York at a mastermind event and he basically said, if you want to become better at sales, read a lot of dating books. So he gave me four, four books that I need to read. So I read those. And then it, first, and it was like, every time you ask for a girl's number, think about asking for a sale. Just make that switch. So I started doing that and, uh, and that helped a lot. So basically the structure that I use for sales call is first, uh, we'll try to determine what the person is, where they're stuck right now. Then where's their dream, where they want to go to. So you basically create the gap. Then we'll find out what the roadblocks are. And then uh, we'll basically start summarizing basically the prison, the dream, the roadblocks, and we basically explain it better to them what their problem is than they can understand themselves. So they think the first time they actually heard somebody say, you know what I what my problem is and you know how to solve it. Yeah. What was the what was the best dating book that you read that helped you with sales? I think uh, the game from Neil Strauss that was okay. really good. Yeah. Like certain like certain tricks. Like one thing that I liked was like he was like picking up girls and then going to three different places. So I was like, okay, if I want to have a new client, he needs to follow me on three different platforms. So there can be email, there can be YouTube, and there can be Instagram, for example. Yeah. Then the chances of me getting a successful client is way higher than they just follow me on one platform. So I started implementing all of those stuff, and it helped a lot. Oh, that's really awesome. So what you would do is you would put in your email to have people go onto your Instagram or your YouTube or what yeah, would you so do we, to get them to, to spread themselves up that way? Yeah. So for example, if I did an email, I would send them to a YouTube video and then I'll ask them to subscribe and they get more videos like that. Yeah. So I know, and then for some things I will send them to my Instagram and say, if you give me a certain like goal, so you like it and you follow my page, they'll get a free gift. Okay. Awesome. And that's, and that's all really worked. Okay. And then from there, is there anything else that you wanted to mention on that entire system of Facebook ads to copy, to webinar, to selling, or is there any so, other big lessons or resources that somebody who's watching this could go and grab? Don't think you can write one campaign, one ad, one ad set. That doesn't work. Like that's something that I tried and I think I spent like 100K on it and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. So what you literally need to do is like, nobody's going to respond best to the language that you write the first time. You need to split test your languages. Okay. So one thing I noticed is like for every campaign, make at least the minimum is five ad sets and make five different ad variations. So test an image, two different images, two different videos, maybe a carousel, but try different variations and see what works. Same thing with headlines. Write five different headlines, five different uh, copies that you actually post in your Facebook uh, post and use colors. Like a lot of Facebook ads that I see are black and white and gray. Like they don't stand out. Think about it. If I have my phone here and I'm just scrolling through it, it needs to pop out like crazy. Like some video uh, images that I use get like a 20% click through rate. Those are insanely high, but I know that if you're scrolling like, what's that? And then you start reading it and if it's appealing, you will click the link. Yeah, the, um, you know, just to interrupt you there for a second, like Rudy Maher, 
uh m-a-w-e-r is his last name like i just saw a youtube video of him the other day red sweatshirt he has a white background with all these red things on it his youtube ad like it just pops and stands out and that guy has you know he has one with pikachu as a facebook ad you know just so many colors in those things and we've modeled that with a lot of colors and um you know making sure that you know we had one with a pink background that was that was really really successful so just anything to catch their somebody's attention with your video or your ads it's essential right yeah like you need to distort like you make a difference you always give the louis vuitton example like the way the louis vuitton store is like take four stores like just random stores and put them next to a louis vuitton store you still walk into the louis vuitton store why it just plops out it's totally different yeah. your ad should be that one because then people are like i want to learn more and they start watching it that's absolutely amazing um so money has allowed you to travel and we're going to switch yeah. gears here but it also allowed you to like save your father was it last summer or two summers uh, ago 2000 uh 2019 november 2019 so would you mind telling us that story and how you were able to use the four high income skills even in that situation where you weren't necessarily making money but you were helping him yeah so i remember i was actually shooting content in the gym and my mother called and I was like, yeah, I'm shooting content. I cannot take the phone right now. Then she called three times, like in a space of five minutes. I'm like, okay, that's not good. So I called her back and she was like, yeah, your dad fell during a bicycle. Uh, they basically were cycling outside and he fell and he fell with his head basically on the road and they weren't traveling really uh, fast. He was like going five miles an hour. So it was really slow, but like, my mother was like, there was blood all over the floor. An ambulance is coming. I don't know what to do. Like, she is not perfect in English. So they were in Portugal and they speak Portuguese and a oh, bit no. of English is not really good. So I called my travel agent and got a plane and I was like there in three hours. I was there. So I flew directly there. Like, basically, I like told my team, like, I need to go. I got on the plane, took my wife with me, and we just basically flew there. So I think five hours later, I was at the hospital. And he was basically, he was in a coma at that point because he fell on his skull. And basically it looked like if you take uh, things with, like if you take a nail and you take it in, if you take an uh, x-ray of nails, basically that's how his skull looked like. It was totally broken. So wow. they told him he had a severe uh, concussion and he had some brain damage, but they didn't know how, how heavy it would be. So I was there and on the uh, IC, it was like, it was really good. Like it was, it was clean. The doctors were very professional. They were good, but they had a hard time figuring out what was going on. And I was probably there for like two weeks already before like, and then they were like, yeah, he's improving a little bit, but it goes very slow and we just have to take it day by day. Well, then was a good thing. It was like, I work online. I just need a good internet connection and I can basically work. So that I was able to do. So I continued my work, but I had to drive like a, an hour to the hospital every day an hour back and go there oh. twice a day because my mother wanted to go in the morning and they wanted to go at night but my mother cannot drive at night because she can see in the dark Got so it. i did that and while well, i worked like probably eight hours a day well i drove like four hours a day so that was pretty tough uh and then at some point he was at the ICU and it was like it's not life threatening anymore he's gonna make it so they take him to like a semi icu like in between it's not like hospital care or an ICU, but like in between. And the first day he was there, I was like, oh my God, what is this? It was super dirty, like insanely dirty. And there were like 30 people in a small room. And I was like, okay, this is not good. And the first day he got an infection, like a bacterial infection, because like there were like, like I couldn't even fit between his bed and somebody else. Wow. So, and the guy next to him was like coughing like crazy. I was like, this is not a good ideal environment to heal. Yeah. So he got a first inject, uh, infection and then he got another infection and then he started hallucinating in his sleep. So he was moving around like crazy and it was like, he had, he had restraints on it and it was literally bleeding because he was moving so much, but he was still in a coma. So he, we couldn't really talk to him and get out of whatever was going on. And I was checking stuff and I was looking at x-rays and stuff like that, what I was supposed to do, but it was like, like, I know a lot about the human body. Let me just look. And one of the doctors was basically like, okay, here's the file. Just look, go through it, do what you want. Like, 
we do everything we can, but we have no clue what's going on. So I was reading and I was like, this is not going right. Like they have no clue. They have no idea what they're doing. This is going wrong. So for a few times, I already called the healthcare provider from like, we need to get them back to the Netherlands. Like this is going wrong. You don't know what to do. And they were like, no, that's not possible. There aren't any ICU beds in the Netherlands available right now. And uh, we think he's fit to fly in a normal plane in about two weeks. I was like, it's going wrong. And you think he's fit to fly in two weeks? No way that's going to happen. So first thing, I, I knew a couple of people in the uh, hospital care because in our coaching, there are a lot of people that have high functions, like the big entrepreneurs. And one of the women that I knew was the head of an ICU in a department. So I called her up and I explained the situation. It was like, okay, I can get an ICU bed for you. Like, no problem. If you want a bed, I can arrange a bed for you. And so I was like to the hospital, uh, the healthcare service provider, I was like, I got a bed, we can travel, take him and bring him. And I was like, no, we cannot do that. And like, because he can fly in two weeks. And I'm like, who's telling you he can fly in two weeks? It's going wrong. So I was like at a point like, okay, this is not gonna work. So I basically went online and was like, I need a hospital transfer. I basically went to Google, I'm fine. And in the Netherlands, I couldn't find anything. And then I was like, okay, what's well, other country near to us? That's good. I was like, Germany probably has something. Germany is pretty big. So I found a German company who can actually do it. And so I paid the entire flight. I can't remember how much it was. I remember I got it back later. But, uh, so I paid for the entire flight. It was more than, I think it was over 30,000 euros that I paid for him to fly from Faro to Rotterdam in a special, like, it's like an ambulance plane. It's something special. So they flew very low because they couldn't get that high because of brain pressure. So wow. they flew very low back to the Netherlands. And they got him to the ICU in the hospital that I arranged. It was very close. And they basically told me later that if he stayed there for two more days, he would be dead. Like, wow. that's why, I got, yeah, they did, a, they did a checkup and it was like, he's in very bad shape. His entire lungs were filled with fluid and dirt and all this kind of stuff. And they basically told me like, that's a good decision that you made because two days later, we won't have made it. So, Basically, the healthcare provider had to pay me back for like a lot of money. And they basically told me like, oh, you did a good thing. And then we started getting into problems in the Netherlands because I was like, okay, I don't trust doctors anymore because they make many mistakes. So I started reading books about uh, how the human brain works and all that stuff. And I was reading stuff and I was like, okay, we need to change this. We need to change this diet. We need to do this. And as, uh, luckily, in the first hospital I was there, our friend was the head of the ICU. So it was pretty easy for me to say, okay, we're going to do this and this, this with diet. So that improved a lot. Then he got moved and then we started all over again. So, but it's getting better now. He still has some brain issues. Like his short-term memory is not yeah. that great. And he has lost one eye vision. So one eye is not uh, moving anymore, but he can walk. He can go to the stairs. He can go by himself to the restroom. He can dress like... 80% of what he used to be able to do, he can still do, but you can see that he got hurt. That's something you can always going to be see, but he's still here. Wow, that's powerful. And it, all of those high income skills are pretty much at play in that, which goes to show you it's not always about money. And, <laughs> and one of the things is that while you were, while you were doing that, you were you know, your business was running and, and I forced you to hire good people and, and be able to lead good people. So one of, uh, one of our mutual friends, I think you've met for us uh, through a mastermind, this uh, runs a supplement company in France. Questions yeah. for you. He's like, how did the talent he needs to run this business? Uh, how many talents? Yeah. How do you find all the talent you need to uh, over 100. Yeah. So one thing I noticed with hiring personnel, it's not so much about the talent. It's more about the social skills that somebody has. Because one thing I noticed is you can give anybody all the knowledge they need to know, but you cannot teach social skills. So that's something I noticed. Is So I try to find the best fit possible, but then I will take the person that's the socially the best. And I will buy whatever education they need to get them to the level I desire them to be at. So a lot of my people that I hire, people say like, they're not qualified yet. And I'm like, that's correct, not yet. 
they give me six months and it will probably be better because they have the social skills and I'll give them the blueprint to get better. Amazing. Yeah. Okay. What about in terms of organization, you know, you need to have in certain positions in your company, you need to have some highly organized people. So what do you look for? How do you train organizations so that people, you know, you get everything organized up to your level and your standards? Uh, what, uh, one thing that it is a trick that I heard is like, just buy people from other companies and pay them a higher price. That's one thing I did. It's like, if they're really good doing a good job at there, I just pay them more and I just buy them out. That's one thing I did. Other thing is like, I'll give them math equations that they need to solve. And I'll look at them and I was like, okay, don't use your calculator. I want you to write it out. I don't care if you get this right or not, but I can see the way when you write, if your structures are not. Because if you're like all over the place, you cannot keep it contained. You're never going to solve it anyway, but you're not working really structured. Like I'm teaching nutrition courses normally in the Netherlands. That's one thing I do in my businesses. Mm -hmm. And one thing I notice is like a lot of people mess nutrition calculations up like crazy. But the people that are very structured, very organized, are mostly a lot better. So I'll give them certain equations. Okay, solve this and just write it out in front of me. And I'll see how they go. And I'm like, okay, you're structured or you're not. I can literally see it by doing it like that. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, you, so how do you, um, how do you handle the financial risks of having so many businesses and so many investments to make them develop? Uh, I got a friend who runs, we was used to be a CFO at a very big, uh, big company in the Netherlands. He's now retired, basically he sold the company, made a lot of money, doesn't need to work anymore. Uh -huh. So he gives me advice. So that helps a lot. And a lot of things like, I don't really feel fear. So I'll make a decision very quickly and I'll see just how it goes. Like I've made a lot of mistakes. Like I probably launched like five products that failed instantly. I didn't sell a thing. Or I, make, I made a big investment and I didn't sell any of it. So I still have like, I got a room upstairs full of stuff that I tried to sell and I didn't sell. Like I went into supplements and I think I sold four, four types of supplements. That's all I sold. So not everything is going to be a success. Like I failed a lot of times, but I take the jumps and some of them succeed and some of them don't. But I take the risk. Why, why do you, have you always not had the fear or is that something that you've built up over time? I think uh, the reason I don't have fear is like, I know in the gym, I'm a really good trainer. I feel that by heart. Like, so I know like if everything goes wrong, I can always go work in the gym and make a decent living as a personal trainer. Like I can always do that. Like my name is that good that even if I fail with anything else, I can go back in the gym and make a good salary and just continue to work for that and probably go back and be do it all over again. Yeah. So I don't have the fear to go back anymore. And I think that really helped. It's like, I know my skills are that good that even if I mess up really good, people will still hire me. I can still do certain things because they just trust who I am and what skills I have. Got it. And then how do you find the people to run the other businesses that you're not involved in on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, most of them come from my fitness coaching business and I, uh, and I work with them for a long time. So I have a level of trust with them. And then I know for like, okay, this person is really good at managing this kind of stuff. If I give them this assignment and they are okay with it and they find it a nice challenge, they're going to do an amazing job. So they always start off in the fitness coaching business first, and then they move up to a new level and they start doing other stuff. So it's always people who have been around me for a long time and who I just know. And I know for the fact, like, if I give you this, you will do it. Like they've proven that. Yeah. yeah. Awesome, man. Man, you just have so much going on. Uh, what's your morning routine and what have you done uh, that has worked for your productivity and what hasn't worked for your productivity? Uh, so it starts the night before. So one thing I'm a firm believer of is the red gla orange glasses for sleep. And then I make my to-do list. I make them on my phone because my handwriting isn't that great on the phone. I can actually read what I wrote. Uh, so that's what I have a to-do list. I only write down three things that I need to accomplish today. I don't write 25 things because I don't get that done. What I'm like, 
is I write down three things and I get them done. Anything extra is a bonus. Like I know if I yeah. take the first block in 30 minutes, I can knock those three things out. I've done, I have a good day. And then anything else is a bonus. So basically that's how I start. So yeah. I wake up around 5 a.m. I'll drink two uh, shaker cups of water to hydrate. Um, and then I'll start doing my first three tasks of the day. That can be writing copy, uh, building a new program, building a new webinar, optimizing a webinar, stuff like that that I'm doing at the moment. It's always a task that will help my business generate uh, more income and go to the next level. Uh, super, so, super powerful. Yeah. So that's my first block, and it's about 30 to 45 minutes. Sometimes it's 45. Like if I'm in the zone, I can probably go for 45 minutes straight without anything. My phone is basically, I just open it up and it's in, in uh, airplane mode. So I just check my, uh, my to do list. Okay, those are the three things I'm going to do. And then I put it away. And I don't feel like I can literally put it next to me. And I don't feel the urge to check messages or to do anything of that. Like I don't have that problem. And so I'll do that. Then, so that's the first block. Then I'll probably grab an energy drink or something like that after the first block, play a little bit of the dog because he wakes up. Like first time I walk by, it's like, you're early. And he goes back, and he goes back to sleep. <laughs> and then, then 45 minutes later, he's probably a little bit more awake and he wants to go outside, do his thing and then come back. So I play, play with him for five or 10 minutes. Then I do my second block, and that's also about 45 minutes. And those are new projects that I'm just thinking about and trying to evolve. So that can be anything like new program that I'm thinking about building or a new business I'm starting or a skill that I need to learn for something new. So it can be something like that. Then I'll have breakfast with my wife together. And then I'll basically start whatever the day is taking me. Like it can be calls, meetings, stuff like that. What about your evening routine? How do you plan for the next day? What, and how do you shut things down? Uh, so probably I, I end my day around 7.30 PM, something like that. And I'll probably watch a, a Netflix with my wife for 45 minutes. We would just watch one episode. So 45 minutes to an hour. What do you guys uh, tend to watch? Uh, right now I'm watching The Startup. That's a new Netflix okay. series. Yeah. But like uh, we watch a lot of like CIA stuff, uh, like basically Jason Bourne kind of stuff, that kind okay. of stuff. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll walk the dog. So yeah. because he needs to walk. And then I'll read for a bit. And I don't read nonfiction. I actually read business kind of read stuff that not the best thing to do for your sleep, but I still do it. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, I have a bunch of supplements I'm trying out right now. I've got a protocol that I'm testing, see if it's optimized with my sleep. Not sure not to work yet, but I'm testing that out. So a lot of into optimizing the health. Yeah. And then I go to bed. Let's do that. It's like I end my book, I write my to-do list, take my supplements, go to bed. Got it. All right. I know you love biohacking stuff. And um, I'm interviewing Ben Greenfield for my next podcast. It, it, yeah. Are there... Are there like one or two questions that you would love for me to ask him? I think the best thing uh, to keep your focus, like we all like, I know normally it's like a 25 minute blog that somebody can really focus hard. Yeah. I've been able to extend it like to 35, maybe 40 minutes. And then I noticed like I start to divert a little bit. Yeah. So if you have tricks to extend that, that would be okay. a good one. Uh, I think uh, his strategy about HRV, so that's basically if your heart rate and then the time between the two heart rates, that basically yeah. determines how much stress you have. Is uh -huh. best strategies to optimize that, basically because if your HRV is higher, you're capable of handling more stress and you probably get better results in anything you do. Okay. So, and I listened to a few podcasts of him where we went really into depth about it. I'm like, but what are your top three strategies? Because they were like super deep. I'm like, what's the thing that's really easy? um okay so those two will probably be the ones that i would ask first yeah amazing my man amazing and then last i mean you you study and learn so much and i know that you've talked to my mastermind members about your your method for doing it just quickly 
how do you read so many books and consume so much information? So I think this is the only thing I did in school where I actually got value from next to like learning how to read, how to write and math. Then there was like, I did speed reading courses. So I can speed read. So that definitely helped. And then one thing I started doing at some point was I was in the plane. I don't remember what flight and I had to book an audible as well. So like, let me just try this out. I put it on an audible on 4x speed, put it earphones in and I use a pen and I just go with the book as the audible goes. And then I was doing it. And I think I read the entire book in 35 minutes. And I was like, well, oh, this is a new record. I broke my record. Like, like I think a 140 page book and I read it in 35 yeah. minutes. I was like, this is a good pace. Like, and I actually can comprehend this. I can follow this. Like the same thing, if I go to YouTube, I always watch everything on 2x speed. Like yeah. if it's 1x speed, I'm like, this is super slow, speed it up, come on. And so that's something I noticed, like I can read really quickly, I can listen quickly, I actually talk quickly. So all that stuff just combined and that worked really well. And one thing I did do is like, uh, or I'll take a video where I write down what I just learned. Yeah, awesome, man. Perfect. Yeah. Frank, this has been amazing and I'm glad you talked really fast because we covered a ton of stuff. Uh, I'm going to make all of my team watch this because it was super helpful and download to them. Um, I guess, you know, most of the people listening to this are speaking English, but if they wanted to see how you do things, what's your, what's your Instagram and, and what else would you like people to check out? So just my name in lower cases, Frank de Blanken. It's just to get them in lower cases. That's how you can find me on Instagram. Perfect, my man. That's what we need. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I really look forward to when we can see each other again through the travel and uh, another event. And really appreciate your time, my man. Anytime. We'll talk soon. Thanks. I told you that was going to be an insane interview, and that absolutely was. Now, it's amazing what Frank's been able to accomplish just in a couple of years of working with me. And as he mentioned, he 20 x his business in under a year and dropped his work hours by about 40%. If you want that too, then click the link in the description below to apply to work with me, and I'll help you build the freedom and life that you want. I know that's like, here I am on my farm with all the space in the world, and I want you to have all the space and freedom in the world too. So just click that link down below and comment and let us know what you thought of today's episode.